various critical and memorable elements of Chrono Trigger, the 1995 SNES masterpiece RPG from Square. If you've never played Chrono Trigger, sit back, relax. Um, I actually uh, own this game on cartridge, which is pretty, uh, pretty cool now, considering how expensive it is after the market manipulation. So, this series will be broken up into two parts. This will cover about two-thirds, or maybe a bit more of the plot, up to a critical element. I'd just like to point out that I am using a hardcore difficulty mod, and it is quite difficult. There are a lot of curves, and you will see some of that gameplay in this video, but you will see more of it in the next one, for sure. classic games, especially in the West, uh, from the retro era, Chrono Trigger, one of the best JRPGs, uh, and specifically I am playing this with a difficulty mod enabled, um, called Lavos's Awakening, and if you don't know, Lavos is the uh, antagonistic force in this game. Lavos is an alien, but we'll learn more about him. And uh, I'm definitely going to be doing a playthrough of this game on my own time regardless, so um, I'm probably going to record only bits and pieces and throw together some edits of interesting plot points. And perhaps difficult segments of the game. Good morning, Chrono. What an iconic intro. And uh, we'll see that line become motific, the concept of waking up. Uh, we see that a lot in Chrono Cross as well, the uh, spiritual successor to this game. Technically the sequel, uh, just not involving any of the same characters. Uh, but otherwise, we have to run into Marl, our kind of protagonist lady, aside from Luca. Essentially, she lost her pendant, uh, which, you know, is right here. <laughs> and uh, we're going to entertain her at the fair, and we will learn a little bit about her. We will uh, revisit once that happens. And we will, of course, keep her name tomorrow. Okay, so we have just been told that uh, Luca's um, invention is all set up. So we're about to see an extremely iconic and uh, honestly a, a timeless cutscene uh, with Luca here. All right, let's head up here and uh, see what Marl has for us. The super dimension warp invention of the century. Okay, so let's uh, see this demonstration here. So first, uh, we're going to meet Luca here. She's going to teleport us to the other pad. And we're going to watch this demonstration with Chrono, and then we will watch it with Marl. And Marl's pendant is going to cause uh, an anomaly to occur. And uh, the rest of the game will be us exploring uh, not only the consequences of that, uh, but the consequences of us uh, getting a glimpse of the future, essentially. So ultimately, Chrono Trigger is a game about going into the future to save the future, uh, which is uh, an interesting existential twist of going into the past to save the present or to save the future. Uh, but rather, Chrono and his gang actually save a future 1999, which they'll never see. They'll never live that long, of course, as the game takes place canonically in around 1200, uh, this present time. But we'll kind of be hopping all over. I'll let you ex 
explore this for yourself. Moral's pendant begins reacting, and boom. <laughs> we get some lovely, really complex rendered graphics for the time. Uh, done so with really interesting computing. invention uh, immediately went awry. That is Luca's father, I believe. The man with us. Luca comments that she recognizes her. Well, we will find out that she is actually the uh, king and queen's daughter. She is the princess of this uh, local barony. What a fine lad. I don't know where this machine is going to send you, but we haven't any other choice. As Chrono's theme plays, one of the most brilliant SNES compositions or even video game compositions ever, uh, ever conceived, frankly. Unlike Sergei from Chrono Cross, um, Chrono himself is uh, quite a quite a brave traveler for the forces of good. Whereas uh, Sergei is a little bit more realistic and layered, where he is not thrown into such a two-dimensional issue as Chrono right off the bat. And he's looking after himself, dealing with issues that are beyond his comprehension. We will see this cool cutscene here of us traveling through time. score to accompany, and we end up north in the mountains. As we try to leave here, we encounter our first battle. And just like that, uh, the blue imp boss battle of <laughs> Lavos's Awakening uh, Chrono Trigger mod is complete, uh, very exciting, very, uh, very difficult. Um, legitimately had to grind uh, to do that. Uh, so, you know, I'm excited. That should be enough. Uh, it would have been nice to level up there, but you know. So we're at the end of the canyon, and now to see the overworld. Uh, now on to the theme wind scene. Um, very, um, again, very classic scene. Uh, very classic theme, rather. Wow, that's interesting. I didn't say anything about fighting Magus' uh, army, but um, we'll, uh, we'll see more about him. Oh, we are going to buy another shelter because we can never be too careful. Uh, but first, we are going to run into the princess. You know, Mara. Okay, so we return to Guardia Castle in the past 680, only to find out that Marl was in the place of the princess, that the real princess had gone missing, or, or a queen rather, I believe. No, no, I do believe it is princess. And then we tracked some suspicious activity to this cathedral, this abandoned cathedral. We're in Frog named Indo in my playthrough, the only character I rename, because Frog is not his real name, nor is he a frog. Um, helps us out, and he's quite a chivalrous 600 AD lad. Um, this is, <laughs> this is a really difficult, not a really difficult, but this is a, a challenging boss on, uh, regular difficulty, and, uh, what's interesting here is I just got super, super lucky with the fact that he's standing too close to counterattack, um, and Chrono and Frog can just spam X-Strike dual deck, which is the best damage at this level, and as you can see, I, I'm doing an extraordinary amount of damage. Uh, to be hitting 100s already is pretty awesome. Um, and this fight ends up being pretty 
very simple. And we will finish this up. And get the real Princess Nadia back. After rescuing her, uh, the bloodline uh, is no longer at risk. There he goes. And so Marl returns. And we can be on our way back to our time, 1000 AD. There she is. <laughs> Lean, that's it. Not Nadia, of course. Of course, this is Frog's duty, is to uh, essentially act as a, uh, a shield for the royal family. <laughs> There's the real Chancellor, who is also kidnapped. So we return back to the castle, where we are handsomely rewarded with words. However, we will come to find out that Frog does not feel so indebted. In fact, he feels disgraced. And so Frog leaves up his arrow's badge, and he simply leaves. Thus, Morrow returns now that uh, the real Lean is saved. If her relative were killed in 600 AD, which she was only at risk because they began interfering in the past, Chrono, Luca, and Marl, um, then Marl would no longer exist. So they have successfully intervened in their own intervention. And hopefully they can get out of there with no more harm done. But as we will soon find out, it is a little bit more complex than that. However, it is not so simple as um, them changing uh, too many things in the past. Rather, their crisis lies in the future, which is quite the interesting spin, as I've commented. So Marl, Chrono, and Luca have decided to escape out of 600 AD, as they are still mind-blown, and uh, they're going to head back to their time. As we can see, Luca really is the uh, genius behind uh, this operation. Um, Luca is actually quite interesting in Chrono Trigger and uh, Chrono Cross. Uh, her Spectre history remains uh, quite relevant. And here we go. Yeah, Luca's scientific breakthrough kind of led way for a lot of this to occur, although the events of Chrono Trigger, aka the devastation and the time warping that Lavos is responsible for, um, kind of will happen independent of Luca, in my opinion. So we return Nadia to the castle, where we are accused of kidnapping her. So, so much for being welcome back in our own time. And we are put on trial for a very, uh, very famous, very iconic segment in RPGs, where it's not exactly clear if we are being framed, or if this is just a feudal institution that, you know, doesn't place the same stock in prosecution as we do now in the uh, 21st century, of course. Hang him upside down for a few years. That doesn't sound so bad to Chrono. But no, Chrono's not having any of that. And I'm pretty sure the guillotine was not yet invented by 1000. I'm glad that they still do have a jury, though. So, 
we are being charged with premeditated abduction of royalty. But my lawyer is arguing that no <laughs> abduction took place, right? Morrow came with us on coincidence. However, the chancellor will quick point out that there is quite a bit of circumstance surrounding this. <laughs> such as Chrono potentially uh, bumping into her on purpose in order to get the pendant. And that Lucas invention was just a plot to kidnap her. I'm glad that Pierre is objecting for me, though. What a champion. I will say Pierre brings up a good point about there being no motivation, however. <laughs> the Chancellor, honestly, has a better retort, <laughs> which is ransom, which is totally fair, as we are in a feudal society. However, we are defending our point that uh, we are not interested in our fortune, however, the Chancellor is going to call up more circumstance <laughs> and comment that I sell the pendant, which I did in my game, or simply to have them see it, rather, a man. Um, regardless of what happens, you are found guilty. It's an implication that even if you are found innocent, which is possible by the jury, that the Chancellor will still imprison you. And that is true. So behind the iron bars, Chrono goes, a traveler of time, and then quickly imprisoned in his own time. So again, we are we are starting to see the uh, unique way in which this time traveling uh, plot device really unfolds. And one of those unique ways is the nonlinear way in which you travel back and forth through time. essentially interacting with yourselves over multiple generations as you change the world in ways that are beneficial to your plan. And we're going to take that card out because no way, sir. <laughs> I'll put this man up. <laughs> but things like um, the red stone, for example, which we will need coming up soon. You know, they were used in prehistoric times, so we see Chrono go uh, to the prehistoric era, and all the sorts. So after you finally navigate your way out of the prison, you meet back up with Luca. And you attempt to escape across the bridge. Amazing. Top secret document. Yes, I would like to read that. Dragon tank. Yes, yes, yes. So, yep. You come up to your next boss. Which on this mod was very difficult. I actually wipe on this attempt. And I do not record my kill. And in fact, for a while, I, I don't have any boss kills. On the hardcore mod. Okay, so the Chancellor calls forth a <laughs> dragon tank, which we go to battle with. Quite sophisticated technology already by 1000 AD. So when it says that energy is stored in the wheels, it's going to charge us. We need to use Chrono's ability slash to uh, dissipate energy being stored. It's really only important for like two fights that I could think of, being this one and Masamone later. Um, so obviously I did not see the uh, first message because I get stomped here, I should have slashed. I actually didn't do as much damage, but uh, it's, it's just the speed at which <laughs> having all three uh, body parts 
because the bits actually respawn, right? So they go down here, and there's going to be a, a five-turn countdown. Or not turn, but a five-cycle countdown, whatever his stamina is, and so this game works on an active battle timer. And then it will respawn the bits. And that part about it definitely gets a little bit hairy. Um, when you're dealing with mana issues, um, Ethers are really far and few in between uh, early on in this game. So you really you really want to be saving those for a last case scenario in situations and especially in a mod like this I had no idea where the difficulty was taking me. Well, like I've said before, games like Final Fantasy VII, I have that combat system down to a T. I've played it so many times. I've played so many hardcore mods. Chrono Trigger, not quite the same way. But Chrono Trigger's system is inherently uh, easier. It's simpler. I mean, it's very smooth and it's very timeless, but compared to something like Final Fantasy VII, it, its depth is uh, slightly limited. You, you end up in quite a... Uh, quite a spam cycle, which is fine, right? Because at the end of the day, this is a, a strategy game in a sense, right? RPGs, especially turn-based RPGs, are strategy-based. And when you play with mods like this, well, it encourages that uh, strategy mentality because you are oftentimes forced into certain uh, methods for certain parts of the game simply because these, you know, it's not the base game. There are modifications made for you to enjoy it in ways that you haven't before. And one of those ways is to push you, you know, above and beyond. Like, I haven't finished my playthrough here because I'm working on, you know, this two-part video at the same time. But I can only imagine the final fight is going to require all of the ultimate gear to even be viable. Whereas, regularly in Chrono Trigger, if you got all of the ultimate gear, the final fight was a joke. And that's kind of what I did, because, you know, all the ultimate gear is linked to all the, uh, you know, all the final side quests, all the loose ends. But, that's why we have, uh, that's why we have patches. That's why we have, uh, entire communities that are really, really interested in preserving this. Speaking of which, uh, the Guardian. And so, behind him, we're going to find kind of a, uh, a master control room with a computer. And uh, we are about to see quite a magnificent cutscene for the time and just in general. And this is our first visualization of Lavos. society kind of falling apart. is a lovely theme. You can actually hear on the uh, 
was recording before I turned off my mic. <laughs> can hear my keyboard trying to dance to it. And yeah, Chrono sees this, and this is a really pivotal moment. I mean, obviously the plan for the group is to go into the past before Lavos erupts and to try to stop him. But ultimately, they are planning to save a future that they'll never see. So we uh, end up in a factory trying to get out of here because this future is pretty bleak right ruined world and we meet up with uh, some of robo's boys and they uh, beat them up then we do that fight i think that's kind of the fight that caused me to stop recording because it took me a very very long time to uh successfully do it was it was horrible on this on this mod probably the worst fight i've done Luca fixes him up, and we are out of there. Goodbye, 2300. And where are we now? We are at the intersection of time. I'm in, in the game, it is translated to the end of time, or at the brink of time. And here is a, you know, sort of collection of uh, the times that we have visited. So it's just kind of an overworld to be able to visit it. So here we are, back in 600 AD. Trying to hit up Frog, you know. So on the computer it was documented that Magus summoned him, and, and Magus is... Um, enemy of the kingdom in 600 AD, so that's why we go back to 600 AD, where we're trying to hit up Frog. But Frog will not join. And so we decide we'll reforge the Masamune for him, and, you know, he must join, since he's kind of bound to the sword because of his backstory, which we'll learn a little bit more about. So Massa and Mune are going to test us. We're gonna stomp him in his two phase fight. This is not my gameplay of the fight. Otherwise I would have shown it, although they were pretty easy on the mod. I don't actually think I uh I don't think I wiped, or maybe I did once or twice, but yeah. with us, they decide, you know, we're worthy, and they decide to let us have the sword, but we come to realize it's uh, broken, I think uh, only the blade is left, so that was his uh, final fight, final phase rather. Correct, it's just the blade. And no, it is not just a myth robo. So we need to find someone who can fix this sword. Now uh, we know Malgrair from present time, 1000 AD. But what's funny, and I don't have this recorded, but when we check the sword, there's actually an inscription on it that has his name, which is interesting. Because it is a sword we found in 600 AD that has been long broken. And yet he seems to be the forger. So who exactly is Malgrier? And there it is, the corridors of time. Many people's favorite theme from the entire game. I'll let you enjoy this for now. Tells us that we need redstone, dreamstone. Fuck, I don't even know what he said. <laughs> I believe dreamstone. Yep, but it's a it is a redstone that no one had seen any, uh, or no one has used any in you know eons. And so we travel to the portal that was left for us in the brink of time, which is. 
was 65 million BC. <laughs> so we go way back into the prehistoric, historic era. And we run into a human. <laughs> Isla. Kind of early for uh, humans to be around. And uh, we actually learn reason for this. We also find out that this prehistoric era has some issues of its own, namely they're kind of fighting a war themselves with reptile people who walk the earth. Uh, where did the reptile people go in later times, 600 AD, 1000, etc.? Well, it's, it's not clear yet, but it wasn't simply that the humans defeated them, and we'll learn a little bit more about that. So after running into Isla, she invites us back to a festival. And pretty much we're just going to go party in the Stone Age. I mean, it's as simple as that. I mean, there's a reason people call this the greatest RPG. That's why. Here I am doing some massive damage there. This is my gameplay, of course. You can tell because I got the blue UI on, obviously. I never play without the blue UI. It's too classic. Let's go party. Listen to that brilliant theme. See a prehistoric earth, pretty, pretty brown. I check out these huts, but there's not much to do. Uh, there are items we can buy here, like special items, but um, I don't have any recording of that. And it's, 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 it's whatever, it's fine. going to scorn Kino. 
so Magus's power is pretty extraordinary, and we are still under the impression that he is the one who created Lavos, right? The idea of this creator who, who fabricated a monster that he cannot control or even grasp, but that's not true, right? Because <laughs> Lavos is a beast, okay? And I feel like he would find it almost offensive to, uh, <laughs> to think that some might hold the uh, misinterpretation that he was created by Magus. So it's a little spoiler, but we'll, we'll get to learn a little bit more of how Magus and Lavos are connected. Now Frog joins us, and we make our way to Magic Cave, where we are met with yet another flashback. Marshmallow Glen. What a weird thing to say. I wonder how the translation fared for that one. We get a very nice bridge scene. I'll take this time here, guys. I'll just post about the graphics. So for one, the character design. A lot of them. Akira Toriyama actually worked on them. Which, if you've noticed by the uh, icons for the characters, that's the creator of the Dragon Ball series, right? That's why Chrono looks like Gohan. <laughs> and why Marl looks like Bulma. It's because it's the same artist. And so when people talk about the visual beauty of Chrono Trigger and the characters and all that, Akira Toriyama, he, he gets a lot of that credit. And you know, <laughs> you could hate on Dragon Ball all you want by saying, you know, it's great, but it's got all this. Chrono Trick is nice because it's great, but it doesn't have all that, right? It's, it's just a timeless, people hail it for Christ's sake. Um, I still think Final Fantasy VII's a, a better game, but Chrono Trick is absolutely up there for um, reasons that especially have to do with its narrative. The fact that it has a solid A-plus combat system uh, absolutely is a, uh, you know, a big plus since its narrative is essentially god dear but Final Fantasy VII has the god dear combat system and the god dear story, so. And just like that, a frog's about to do some sweet shit. She's got some status ailments, but nothing big. 
I actually had more trouble on her than uh, Slash on this playthrough. Uh, Ozzy freezes himself and we, we send him, <laughs> we send him down below. And then our encounter with Magus. Now I will let this play out. This is a big moment in the game. This is 10 plus hours leading up to this. To us, he is the creator of Lavos and the ender of time. But that's not exactly true. He is, a. Uh, nonetheless, even though his uh, goals are kind of tangential to ours. And so, regardless of that, he fights us. And that beautiful score. Man, do I wish I recorded this. No way I'm going back to do it, though. We defeat him and something occurs. Magus falls. Bad timing. Don't wake up on me now. Robo says, according to his records. Lavos just now. Magus says, no, I only summoned him. So it seems the history books don't actually know what happened. And we seem to have opened another gate. And now for the coolest scene in the game. So Chrono here is either having some sort of fantasy. Get out and get a job, Marl says. <laughs> or he is seeing the glimpse of some alternative reality. Given the events of Chrono Cross, I actually do think this is an alternative reality. Regardless of what it was though, Chrono finds himself in the prehistoric age. Like I said, we end up here quite often when something like that goes down. Isla says that she had a strange dream to go to the mountains and that we were there. So we're going to take some pterodactyls to the reptile lair and we're going to finally destroy them as they are ready to wipe out the humans, essentially. And fun fact, you can actually see a red star up in the top right of that shop. We run into Azala once again. Masala's gonna stick something bigger on us, though. Now we're coming up to one of the bigger boss fights in the game. Um, I didn't have too much trouble with this on my playthrough. So 
This was how the air is calling for the red star to crash and turn the earth red. <laughs> so at this point you should start to get a funny feeling that what he's referring to is Lavos. So that'd be quite the uh, information that Lavos actually landed in 65 million BC, not 600. He is far more ancient than uh, the history books know. And it starts to make sense then why he intervenes in time the way he does, throwing uh, people off course, as we'll get a uh, further look into later. Uh, because he has been sitting in the earth watching, observing, experiencing. He's been accumulating knowledge of, of, uh, of the earth, the wisdom of the people, and the life there. And there he is, the legendary porcupine. Crashing into earth. Lavos's birthday. So now we know, right? 65 billion, 65 million BC. So a potential plan would be to destroy him now. However, the game is not about to end, so that's not what happens. As when Lavos crashes, he burrows himself in such a way to protect himself. Until he, can, until he can heal and one day rise. Much like how Cthulhu sleeps in the earth, waiting to awake him after his slumber. Right, so Lavos at the end of the day is a a Lovecraftian uh, entity. Also, there go the reptites, right? <laughs> it's just like in our world now. Dinosaurs, <laughs> you know, were extinct from a meteor. Same in this world, right? It, it kind of uh, fictionalizes our history. So we find a gate in Lavos' crater site. So and I know I've said this before, but now this is where the game really picks up. We are now sent to an unknown time. Twelve thousand years in the past. So we come to in the game what is referred to as the Dark Ages, 12,000 BC, only to find out that, hey, there is an ancient floating civilization that existed in 13,000 BC, very advanced. What happened to them, you might ask, and why are they so crucial to Lavos, right? Why, why does his gate send us here? Did he create the gate? Was it happen chance, or is it elements of nature working against him? At the end of the day, if Chrono and his gang use uh, this time period to gain information to defeat him or to defeat him here, then, uh, you know, isn't that sort of nature's way of uh, balancing out uh, Lavos' intervention with time in order to circumnavigate his death? Interesting, we're in Seal Palace. We were told that the three gurus working on the quote-unquote mammon machine have uh, disappeared. We're also learning about the chrono trigger and the time egg. So we're being told there that the mammon machine is uh, the source of energy for Zeal, the kingdom of Zeal. But what is the mammon machine? Good, it 
draws energy from Lavos, Greg. <laughs> so I can take a pretty good guess at what happened to this civilization, right? They're also talking about the Ocean Palace, which is a uh, an interesting structure that they uh, own. <laughs> The mammon machine was finished and the queen changed almost overnight. <laughs> Apparently she has become uh, pretty evil. Now the final interesting point here when talking to people in this room is that somebody will be mentioned. Okay, the three gurus, right? We, we already know about that. But Melquir <laughs> is one of the gurus, so that's interesting, right? So. We met Melgrair in a thousand, and we find out he's actually as old as having been around in 600. But now we learn that he is so old, he was a guru in this time, 13,000 BC. It's quite an interesting elevation of character, of course. Now here we run into the bedroom of Shala, one of the uh, queen's kids. She has two kids. Yanus, a boy, and Shala, a uh, teenage girl. I believe she's like 14, 15 in the lore. It's not really that important except for the fact that she's just not mature yet. And she's being called to the mammon machine, or to the, the palace, or to the, the throne room rather. And we make our way to the mammon machine, and we empower Marl's necklace. And then we go back up to the front <laughs> near the uh, the throne room, and we open that door up, baby, because we need to find out what's going on here. Kind of sounds like these people are messing with forces in nature that they shouldn't be. Now I see an interesting figure over to the left there, labeled Prophet. Now this Prophet looks very familiar, though he looks like Magus, and uh, he is Magus. But is he the Magus that we encountered, or is he some Magus from the past? We'll learn that pretty soon. Now they disappear and look to imprison me. And uh, they're successful. <laughs> I'm put in some sort of triangle prison. And Shala and Yanus come, and Shala sets us free. However, Yanus is a kind of a dick. I mean, he's young, but you know, he's a real rabble rouser. Shalosa mentions that the gurus need to be saved, as if something had happened to them, not that they had disappeared for some good reason. And so Prophet, who is Magnus, reappears and tries to separate Shala from us, and he orders us to be sealed away decides to spare us, really interestingly. So here we are, Magus is sealing us, and we are about to be kicked out of 13,000 BC, but we will return. We'll find a way. But there goes that game. Again, we're making pretty good time here. We're only, uh, we're a little over an hour into the recording, and we are quite far into the game. I think this was a much better format to uh, tell this story than in some sort of abridged Let's Play version. Okay, so Luca uh, agrees that there must be something in that area, that, uh, you know, in that time period, rather, that era, that should give us some sort of tool to defeat Lavos, some sort of information, some technique. However, now that we can unlock these doors, we recall one in particular, um, that may have some importance. We head back to the brink of time, and we are informed of a guru. That gate leads to 1999 AD. Go there only if you're looking to 
achieve a shorter lifespan as Lavos will help you leave this mortal coil. <laughs> it's a great uh, little dialogue there. So we are making our way to the Guru of Time, who somehow has ended up in the year 2300. And he informs us that his body, body has since passed, and so he has put his uh, mind into that strange creature. And he gives us his device, the Wings of Epoch, <laughs> which is essentially a uh, oh, time-traveling ship, but it can't fly, only go through time. However, it will fly. Very cool uh, visual. Uzi Punch. Uh, 
That's 2,000 damage per cycle. That's not bad. <laughs> but his arms are already back. So, you know, as long as we play it safe like we did last time. Or not like we did last time, but so long as we play it safe, yeah, the boss is going to be uh, fine. And it was. Uh, I recorded this one in particular. This one I started kind of recording again because <laughs> I knew uh, he was going to be so difficult, but he really didn't end up being that bad. Same thing with the double golems. Him and the double golems were my big roadblocks when I first played this game on, uh, you know, vanilla. So, overall, I, uh, if you made it this far, I hope you're enjoying the game and I, uh, I hope you're, you're interested as, uh, those who'd be playing it, uh, are and, and Lavos and what exactly is going on. Um, you know, the, the way in which secondary antagonist forces like Zeal are introduced are, are really, really brilliant, really stand apart from Final Fantasy, for example, which has a lot of set twists and turns and secondary enemies who start off the primary enemies, but then it turns out there's someone larger underneath now in Chrono Trigger. It's, it's interesting how, how Lavos does uh, start off <laughs> the, uh, the antagonist. He's the first person we learn about, and our sights are set on him, and then they are diverted later on under the uh, under the pretense that it was actually uh, Magus who created Lapos, um, you know, but that turned out to be wrong. What a long boss fight. Then we kind of get to Zeal, and we see their um, exploitation of Lapos and once again, they are, um, they are introduced as this antagonist entity, uh, but in a way that is uh, central to Lavos and the overall antagonist arc in general. And um, in a lot of JRPGs, it just it doesn't it doesn't come together quite like it does here. So we've actually freed uh, Melgar from the past, 13,000 Melgar. It was sealed away after working on the Ocean Palace. Now we're about to get a glimpse of, again, <laughs> every cutscene I say it's one of the best, but they're all amazing. for SNES graphics. <laughs> it's nice. It looks good on the direct draw. So, the floating rock sinks. Once we free uh, past Melkares, so that's, that's one of the gurus down. And uh, Shala immediately comes to meet us. She knows we are back. Interesting. And uh, Yanus comes with her as well. Let's see if they have anything new. 
failed to say it was this time. We run back into Toland yet again, uh, but we actually fight him this time. Toland is another pretty easy boss fight. Uh, I see here that <laughs> melee not working. find out exactly what would work here, so I either stick with Fire Tackle, or more than likely I probably switch to Fire Sword too, and uh, spam heal when I need to. So he will copy your abilities like such, and when he copies physical, he has a HP reducer by a factor of uh, a half. See, I'm speeding that up a little bit. Dangerous, obviously, if he gets you low enough and uses a regular attack, but he can't actually kill you with the iron ball. Gotta be careful not to use some other element, though, to trigger him to do a powerful AoE, or else you'll immediately go down. Really, you just gotta play it safe. switch 
bridges. <laughs> then we step on this platform again, and voila. Nice, neat path to the Mammon Machine. And we will be uh, rewarded for sticking around to see some, some pretty awesome video game cinema, for lack of a better word. Now, this is the other boss that I wanted to record on this playthrough because I thought they would be insane. Kind of ended up being a joke. I'm not actually sure I ended up losing here even once. So they, they have a copycat ability like Dolan, but being two of them, that kind of overcomplicates it here. Like when I hit Luminaire, we're gonna get double electricity from them, which could be pretty bad. Especially without white armor to reduce any sort of lightning elementals. And you can see here we do, uh, I know I don't show it, but I have I think I'm just looking for what to use. I'm going through these menus so slowly, I look so bad. That's alright though, some of the footage I have for some of the later combat is real quick stuff. Um, yeah, they're copying lightning. Uh, switch that over to fire with flare, which is better though, because I have better fire protection at this point between the ruby vests and uh, Luca's innate fire resistance with her Taban um, armor that she gets from her house. Throughout the course of the game. And so I think I spam Luminaire and Flare for a while, but um, towards the end I move into Fire Sword 2. As again, it's, that's insane damage, even though I can only get a single target with a boss layout like this. You know, it's uh, really powerful nonetheless. one of them out would make it uh, significantly safer, you know. And yeah, I, uh, I do have this fed up on the recording, not on the uh, emulator itself. Which is why I have the uh, music way down. See, now that was pretty risky, blowing that with uh, Robo at 340 HP. Okay, there I go for the uh, fire sword too. Oh no, I, I go for the confuse instead, okay. I'm, I'm probably keeping the inventory uh, option open for Luca. So when they copy Dolan is, is uh, when they die. So he's done. I'm in a little bit of a hairy position here, I don't want to die. Um, but I get it off. Um, that was me kind of panic going through the menus. Um, so I use the actual life spell because they come, they come back with more health than if you use an actual uh, revive item. So that was, I don't know if that was a misclick or what, but I definitely did not uh, mean to use lightning dew there. So even though this this fight is still technically uh, in the bag, it's still just a little bit. Uh, just gotta play it a little bit careful. However, it's like there's really no circumstance in which he's going to be able to kill me um, unless I get really unlucky with how they copy Dolan at the end. But you know, I'm set up to make sure I don't get one hit by. Uh, <laughs> you know, a final move AOE. What I really needed to do on this fight to remain a little bit more consistent was to just stick with damage. Which, as I'm saying, that I think I'm heading towards that now. Like, I'm, I should pop this fire sword. Yeah, I'm trying to. Um, once I hit this, it's there's a very good chance I'll die with all the luminaires I've used. Okay, that was the lightning too. I absolutely did not mean to pop. Um, I actually remember that. I remember not being <laughs> too happy about that. Um, Flare, not really that much damage on him, frankly. Okay, now we're finally going 
for the fire sword too. I clearly was getting a little fed up too, because I went through that menu much quicker. Alright, and there's the uh, twin column. Oh, not that bad a boss fight. One of the easier ones of the mod, frankly. Almost every, like, big boss that I did on the mod I wiped on at least once, but usually multiple times. Okay, so something is happening with Lavos and the Mammon Machine, so I better go check it out. <laughs> Push Dalton off to the side. Bye-bye, he says. Alright, this is it. This is our chance. This is the Hall of the Mammon Machine. <laughs> and off he goes into the abyss. I don't know if I ever noticed that. Okay, so Magus is here as the Prophet. Something is happening with Shala's pendant, Shala and Lavos. Something potentially triggered by Chrono. Use the knife on Melchior to stop the Mammon machine. All right, do it, Chrono. Machine turned the red knife into the Masamone. So interesting. The Masamone that we used is actually created by Chrono in 13,000 BC. Now, when I first played the game, I thought that's the final boss, especially when I saw this. Now I was mistaken. Depending on how you play the game, there's about half of the game left. And so Lavos wipes us here. And we see an incredible interaction. In comes Magus as the prophet. And it is our Magus. It is Magus from 600. And he is looking to destroy Lavos. Do it, Magus. Okay, <laughs> we're being uh, intercepted. Shell is being pulled towards Lavos. I know in the DS version of the game, her and Lavos' connection is kind of expanded upon. Magus goes in for the punch slash. And nothing happens. Looks like Lavos has been underestimated yet again. is it. Chrono wakes up and delivers onto us one of the greatest scenes in gaming. I'll be quiet as he does this. Isn't your life precious to you, Chrono? Science has failed me, Lucas says. You challenge Lavos with that battered body of yours. Do it, Chrono. No, 
disintegrated his own body. He's dead. And they have been transported out of the mammon machine. Chrono has therefore saved everyone. And has slipped into the endless time. In doing so, rises once again, or not once again rather, but for the first time, and thus our question as to where is Zeal has been answered. Oh, it is not still floating in the sky, no. Lavos awakens and destroys it. for burning the entire planet's reserve of fossil fuels in pursuit of energy. And down comes crashing the entire palace. A tsunami is incoming. As it should be of a rock <laughs> of that magnitude. I'm gonna be honest, the game doesn't explain how all of those people didn't die from that. Um, as I think they are around. still in 13,000 BC, and Chrono is indeed dead. It was no dream, and it is no gimmick. Uh, Chrono is dead. However, there is hope of potentially bringing him back to life. He is explaining that a gate opened up after that and flung people around. So that answers the question of how some gurus ended up scattered across time, including Magus. Magus must have been one of those people. And to spoil it for you, Magus is Janus. Magus is Shala's younger brother. And when that day occurred, the Janus, as a kid, was flung into 600 AD or, or some period right before then. And he grew up into Magus. That's where I'm going to leave it, guys. I hope you enjoyed. And in the next part, we're going to see about bringing Chrono back. And maybe, uh, I don't know, saving the world. That would be nice. But I hope you guys enjoyed. This was a blast. I took a lot of hours to edit all of this. And just a lot. But it was worth it.